Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted. This is episode 827. I'm Kevin Coulson. And I'm David Pelleggi. All right, I'd like to welcome you guys back to the program. This is going to be a special episode where we talk about uh, what's been happening in the Middle East. It's a big, long, hard topic, but I have with me David Poligli from a very famous church in Jerusalem, and we're going to talk about um, the issues, where we are now, and uh, we ask for you, we're going to ask for your prayers and, uh, and support. Uh, David, welcome back to the program. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you very much for having me. Uh, but I have to confess, I'm sorry to be on your program in these circumstances. Yeah, so. this, this is horrible. Uh, we talked in a little pre-show that this is hell. Uh, we've not seen anything like this since um, the Holocaust, since the, the mid-1940s. And um, as a Westerner over here in America, it's very hard to watch the TV and to know what's really happening, what's not really happening, and to know how we got here, where there's now a war in Israel against Hamas. And uh, let, let's just start with what happened the other day. Well, um, you know, Israel and Hamas, you might say, had these uh, rules of engagement. Um, Israel, on one hand, um, it's hard to find a, it's not always easy to find the, the right word. Israel tolerated Hamas in Gaza uh, as a counter, counterbalance to the Palestinian Authority uh, mm -hmm. in Ramallah. Israel ensured that uh, Hamas got cash from Qatar to um, support the people of Gaza. Israel gave a lot of work permits for Gazans to work. Uh, inside of Israel, occasionally there would be violence that would break out between Israel and uh, and Hamas in Gaza. And uh, this is the way the game was supposed to work. And uh, 10 days ago, on Saturday, the last day of the Feast of Tabernacles, uh, Simchat Torah, you might say that Hamas radically, radically broke the rules of the game, and uh, they launched a incursion, invasion into Israel. And the purpose of the invasion uh, was not simply to kill a lot of Israelis, which they did. Uh, they killed at least 1,500, um, and they massacred them. Um, they wounded 4,000, uh, took about 250 prisoners. Probably the Iranians okayed this or instructed them to do this as a way to um, stop any rapprochement uh, between uh, Israel and Saudi Arabia. Because the Saudi-Israeli bloc uh, against the Shiites, against Iran in particular, uh, would be very, very harmful to the interests, Iranian interests throughout the region. And uh, it appears that Hamas has been uh, at least provisionally successful and uh, on a number uh, on several levels yeah causing uh, horror and shock in Israel um, damaging Israel's deterrence or at least the uh, its image of deterrence and and perhaps getting close uh, if or if not succeeding uh, scuttling uh, any agreement between Israel and Saudi Arabia you and I have recorded shows with Anglican Scripture probably three, four or five times in the last uh, five, six years. And we talked mm -hmm. about this peace that was kind of existing and more towards Saudi Arabia and Egypt and uh, other nations agreeing to work with Israel and mm -hmm. trying to look long, casting a, a longer rope down the road as to what will our, our countries look like 10 years from now and, and, and further. This really disrupts that. This uh, uh, action by Hamas, which, you know, they recorded what they did. They posted the recordings uh, of what they did on the Internet. And I'm surprised that Saudi Arabia is not horrified, that Iran is not no, horrified. That not. Least, no, you know. they wouldn't be horrified by these things, believe me. They, what would horrify them 
or what, what, what shocked Saudi Arabia is that uh, there was an intelligence failure by Israel. Yeah. Uh, and of course, then it raises questions. Can we count on Israel? Can we count on Israeli intelligence? Can we count on Israeli resolve? Um, uh, so what kind of an, what kind of an ally would, uh, Israel be, especially as we, um, uh, stand together, uh, as Saudis would say, as we stand together against, uh, Iran's imperialistic, uh, ambitions, uh, in the Middle East. So, uh, and there is, by the way, uh, there is one level to this that Israel's, um, you might say, reputation up until 10 days ago uh, and its relationships with surrounding uh, Arab countries uh, has been improving and uh, it's been nothing short of miraculous. But at the same time, Israeli policymakers, at least the Israeli policymakers in this current government, um, foolishly, in my opinion, ignored the whole Palestinian issue. Yes, there has to be some kind of resolution with this. And Israel can't um, have peace with Saudi Arabia uh, and uh, ignore uh, the festering uh, problems with the, with the Palestinians, at least uh, in, in the West Bank. Gaza, of course, is something fairly different. So let's talk about the fog of war. Um, here in the West, we read the newspapers, we see the news, and boom, last night, before I'm going to bed, I see that uh, the reports that Israel had bombed a hospital in Gaza. I mm -hmm. wake up and I find out that the, uh, the Hamas had a rocket misfire, and they had done it. Yeah. And well, so, yeah. that's the fog but of war. It, well, in part, it's the fog of war, but uh, there's another element here, and that's sort of an anti-Semitism. Mm -hmm. And it's sort of a, um, you might say, a visceral hatred of Israel um, by some parts of the media um, and uh, many quarters or different uh, circles, academic circles, political circles, uh, business circles uh, in the West. Whenever something happens, it's always Israel's fault. It will always be Israel's fault. And uh, you don't have to check, you don't have to make sure, or you don't have to let the facts get in the way of the truth. And it's really in the, at the bottom line of all this, it's sort of anti it is anti-Semitism. It is, yeah. It's all naked anti-Semitism, because anti-Semitism throughout the generations um, is that the Jews, and now the state of Israel, they are always the enemy of the good, right? So if Jews... Um, support the war in Iraq, they're warmongers. Yes, if Jews uh, are opposed to, to the, the, opposed to the Vietnam War, well, the Jews are liberals, they're leftists, and you're right, and it's all a, a, a Jewish conspiracy of one kind or another. In the Soviet Union, you know, the Jews were uh, cosmopolitan. They were, you know, anti-communist, but for many you know, especially right-wing organizations in the West, the Jews were the communists, right? So, so being, if you're Jewish, you simply can't win. You know, whatever the enemy of the day will be, whether the COVID, the vaccine, yes, um, immigration, people will always find a scapegoat and they will always blame it on the Jews. And that's the way it, it works. Now, Israel is not perfect and Israel is responsible uh, for doing things that are uh, are ethically wrong or uh, strategically stupid, and uh, Israel should be criticized for this, or Israel should be held account for this. But at the same time, um, this uh, overwhelming blame that's always put on Israel for for everything, uh, and again, it's it's simply raw naked anti-Semitism, and it's been something that's been going on in Western societies, at least, for perhaps the last 2,300 years or so. Okay. F news here in the West is this is all about occupation. Israel occupies Palestine, and mm -hmm. um, this is Israel's fault. Shame on them for being uh, the, the bad guy in this. Um, but that's not true, is it? Right. As someone who's not, um, uh, I, I, I'm not uh, going to defend uh, the 
the current yeah uh, stalemate between uh, Israel's Israelis and Palestinians. And, and I should explain to your listener that occupation, quote unquote, or the, the fact that there has been no movement in the reconciliation or peace process for many years is actually the fault of both sides. You know, I've lived in the Middle East for 43 years, and I can safely conclude, uh, as Paul does in Romans chapter 3, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And uh, in that, I can empathize and, you know, understand uh, both sides. Um, But it's all Israel's fault. Well, Israel needs to withdraw. Israel needs to do this. Well, both sides... Uh, don't really want to compromise. And that goes for the Palestinians as much as the Israelis. Uh, At least currently, both sides don't want to compromise. And both sides think they can somehow wait out the other side. Israel can build settlements. Israel can expand its population uh, in uh, in the West Bank uh, and absorb, you might say, more and more uh, territory. Uh, The Palestinians believe, why should we compromise? Because we can get the court of international opinion on our side. And sooner or later, there'll be economic boycotts of Israel. Uh, Israel will become the pariah state. And uh, we'll get what we want without having to make compromises, for example, over over Jerusalem or over issues concerning so- sovereignty. So it, it is an issue on both sides. And people think that in some way the Palestinians they are. They have no um, uh, ability, uh, no uh, advocacy, or they're somehow powerless against Israel. I think you just remind our viewers what happened ten days ago. You know that is certainly uh, absolutely absolutely not true. I think the second point is that we deal with Hamas. We're not dealing with the occupation um, in the 1990s. I can remember this very clearly. Um, Hamas began a bus a campaign of suicide bombing on Israeli buses in Tel Aviv and Jerusalem. And uh, I had a friend who was wounded, uh, lost her hearing. She, she actually was a staff member uh, in our church. She lost her hearing on a, on a Hamas bus bombing. And um, they were bombing and destroying these buses at the very top point where Israelis and Palestinians were making actual progress, yes, on some kind of quote unquote, you know, final peace solution or final deal, right? And there, it, it wasn't their goal to end the occupation. What they wanted to do was to wreck the peace process because they did not want to, the Palestinian Authority, PLO, to compromise, yes, with a with only um, part of the pie, one quarter of the pie, or, or even less that the Palestinians would get. They didn't want a two-state solution. They wanted an Islamic state, right, from the river, the Jordan River, uh, to the Mediterranean. And so their goal has always been not reconciliation or peace or the end of occupation. Their goal is always just basically the destruction of the state of Israel. But under Islamic, their Islamic interpretation, Israel has no um, uh, justification, theological justification uh, to exist, and it uh, and it does need to be destroyed. You mentioned the 1990s. Uh, President Bill Clinton invited Arafat and the pre- Prime Minister of Israel to Camp David for 14 days. They talked. They talked. And in Bill Clinton's book about the topic, he said. For 14 days, Arafat said no. Yeah, Arafat Arafat said no. And he, this was in the the, uh, 1999-2000, he went home and he thought that, and here we're not talking about Hamas, we're talking uh, about the the Palestinian Liberation Organization, which became the Palestinian Authority. Mm -hmm. He thought, oh, I'll get Israel to, um, you know, soften its demands on us. I'll launch a campaign of violence. Uh, I'll launch a so-called popular uprising called the Intifada. And uh, Arafat instigated this. 
And at first, it was first few months, it was a popular uprising with lots of Palestinians. And soon it just became uh, Palestinian uh, m uh, military factions, terrorist organizations uh, that fought the Israelis and also brought uh, the war into Israel, you know, especially via suicide, suicide bombers. And Israel faced a choice then, just like it faces a choice now. And they, people, they felt here that their back was pushed to the wall. They felt that the existence of the state is at stake. And the reason they, they felt that then and feel it now is that if um, Palestinians don't agree with us or they want something, they'll use terror and they will expect us to back down. So we played a game of footsie with them before. And in part, one of the reasons was is that no Israeli mother wanted their son to die, you know, in some urban, uh, you know, in some urban warfare in, in Gaza. People here are quite sensitive to, to the army taking casualties. So let's try to cut a deal with Hamas. But as I said, they broke the rules. People, their resolve is very, very strong. And um, they very likely, you know, will be willing, Israel will be willing to take quite a few casualties uh, in the destruction uh, in, in destroying uh, Hamas. Now the PLO, the Palestinian Authority, um, has for the most part stayed out of this because they hate Hamas. Hamas and the Palestinian Authority are, are, are horribly uh, bitter enemies. And um, it remains to be seen whether the Palestinians on the street, uh, what their what their reaction, uh, what their reaction to be will be, especially after this tragic, horrible uh, bomb, uh, rocket, uh, which was not Hamas, by the way, it was Islamic Jihad. Uh, this rocket fell into the compound of what was known as the Baptist Hospital, but was but is actually an Anglican hospital. Um, so the, the people will, uh, of course, there's, there's a, quite a bit of fury, uh, in this country amongst, uh, Palestinians and throughout the Middle East. And it will be very, very difficult to convince them that, um, it was actually an Islamic Jihad missile. It was a mistake. It was a technical failure. Um, and here's where the old adage in, uh, in the Middle East uh, comes into play. To admit a mistake, Kevin, is to make a second mistake. You don't admit mistakes here. You don't say, I goof, I, I'm, I was wrong, I'm sorry. No, you just blame it on someone else, okay? And so it'll be blamed on Israel and m m many Palestinians who are very convinced by, you know, one conspiracy after the conspiracy theory after another, will believe that it was an Israeli, uh, it was an Israeli bomb or an Israeli rocket or something that uh, targeted that hospital. And the, I think the evidence thus far is pretty clear that uh, that it was not. And what people forget is that uh, hundreds of people probably have died in Gaza uh, due to the rockets, um, the Hamas rockets, Islamic Jihad rockets that had misfired, missed their mark, uh, and fallen on Palestinian uh, buildings and neighborhoods. So, eleven days ago, uh, Israel was kind of at war with itself mm -hmm. uh, before this attack from the Hamas, uh, mm -hmm. and we had a show about that. Uh, mm -hmm. Tell me the, the difference now, in, in just a, a matter of days. Well, um, that war has been put aside, and uh, the enemies of Israel probably thought this would be an opportune time to attack because Israel was uh, very, very uh, divided, bitterly divided over the, uh, you might say, the, the future direction of the state. Uh, but of course, that has united people in, a, uh, in quite an incredible way and national unity and national morale is very strong and um the you might say the political reckoning for this uh, has uh, been put aside for a while 
but uh, I can tell you that uh, Benjamin Netanyahu will not survive this, and his government will not uh, will not survive this because they they've made a number of uh, pretty significant uh, pretty significant mistakes. Um, you know, this is what's kind of amazing about Israeli Jewish society here, and that the government can really screw up if if you're allowed me to use that term sure. uh things can go wrong on, on on the national state level but uh civic society i mean the the way people the citizenry rallies uh comes to the support of the nation fills in those places where uh the state oftentimes uh fails or it's too bureaucratic or or too blind, you know, to perhaps meet either security needs or uh, social needs. Um, so you have all kinds of groups. Uh, first of all, when they heard about the, you know, when they heard about the uh, invasion 10 days ago and the massacres that were happening, kids were calling their parents and parents were, were, were jumping in their car, driving from Tel Aviv, which is, you know, 30, 40 minutes away and going to taking pistols or guns or whatever they could find and going out and looking for their kids and rescuing their kids. And uh, you had police and firemen that some, in some cases had no business being there. Everybody's rushing to sort of uh, fill in those uh, fill in those gaps. Uh, it's a bit, you know, a bit like the Yom Kippur War 50 years ago. And by the way, I'm sure Hamas chose the date as a yeah. way of reminding Israel of the trauma of the Yom Kippur War. When the Yom Kippur War started, Israelis drove up in their cars to the Golan Heights, found a tank, found uh, an army unit, and they joined. Uh, they didn't wait for orders. Um, and so we have it. Uh, this, the support for refugees, the support for soldiers, um, um, it's been, uh, it, it's quite incredible. And I only wish, I only wish the Christians, I wish we would uh, work on uh, work on oftentimes work work on the work on the same way. Um, uh, an amazing show of uh, solidarity uh, and unity, and no one's waiting for the government to tell you what to do. All right, let's talk about on the ground today. Um, on the ground today, you're still a church. On the ground today, we are um, refusing to cancel services, even though Jerusalem has been um, under missile attack, or at uh, least missiles have been sent our way. Uh, we are going to celebrate the life and death and resurrection of Jesus because that um, brings death, you might say, to an end and to celebrate his victory and his lordship. So we're not stopping, we're not stopping Bible studies, men's groups, uh, and more women's groups. Uh, there are a lot of pastoral needs uh, amongst, again, uh, Jews and Arabs who are part of our community, Messianic Jews, Christian Arabs, some Muslims who, who have come to faith. We have 25, last count, 25 youngsters uh, from our community, or uh, they're, they're from families of our community that are in either the army or the police or the emergency services. Many of them are in quite dangerous, dangerous places. So it's keeping track of all of these folks, praying for them and trying to uh, minister to them uh, when they're when they're far away, and there's of course a, a lot of anxiety. Uh, we have a we have a broadcast in Arabic, which is sort of an Anglican service that we do every week in Arabic, uh, and it goes out throughout the Middle East. It's kind of short and simple, but uh, a number of folks in Gaza have become believers through the service. We baptize several of them. We got permission to come in come into to Jerusalem and uh, we're in touch with that uh, fellowship or that circle circle of believers and we're we just got a kind of a way in to help uh, churches in Gaza who will then also help their Muslim neighbors and we have an extensive uh, it's, uh, it's grown uh, hugely in the last 10 days 
uh, outreach uh, with the poor, uh, again, with uh, internal refugees. All of our guest houses are soon going to be open um, to folks um, who live near Gaza or who are living on the northern border. And our great fear, Kevin, is that uh, there will be a war between Israel and Hezbollah. And the army has told folks living on the northern border to leave. So we're going to, again, use all three of our guest houses and maybe even more space where we can find it uh, to house uh, Arab Christians, Jewish Christians, folks who are not Christians. Um, and uh, we've made some pretty serious preparations for that. Yeah, uh, in, the last, uh, in the last week, uh, of course, we have a prayer network up and running and uh, people say, what can you do? Of course, you can give and, and what, but we really, really ask people to, to intercede a, in, a, in a very serious way. And I think I've said this before in the program, uh, uh, I'm a, a huge, huge lover of, of Anglican liturgy, but uh, at this time, our prayers cannot be only the prayers of the people. We have to have uh, intercession that comes with fasting, uh, intercession that uh, comes with waiting on the Lord and having him direct, yes, uh, the things that uh, we could pray for. And uh, not to become, um, what shall we say, um, um, passive and to fall into the old cliche, well, there's nothing we can do. There will always be war between Jews and Arabs, and that's the way it's going to be until the end of the world. Or I don't know how to pray, or I don't know, you know, you know, why I should be praying for those people over there when I've got so many problems here at home. Um, we spoke about that last week at church, and uh, we'll continue to speak about it. Um, that's essential to call people really to to prayer and not to minimize the power, the power of prayer. And for folks who want to put feet to the to those prayers, we. We have a, a mercy fund, and and, uh, and the church is quite active um, as well in, in uh, trying to respond to the needs of, again, believers and those who are not believers. And, uh, yeah, we'd be grateful for any support. But especially, fact, I'll, I'll put a especially link in, I'll, prayer. Yeah, I'll put a link in the show notes for uh, the mm -hmm. mercy fund so people can uh, yeah. click on that and, and uh, forward you some finances. Um, okay, here, $64 million question. Is there a solution? Is there something that can be done in the future uh, to resolve the conflict in the Middle East? Um, yes, the con the, something that can be resolved to the conflict. And, and the solution uh, is the, um, uh, or you might say a... Um, a wonderful um, model for the Middle East is found in Isaiah 19. <clears throat> and I don't always believe that it has to be this unstable <clears throat> or this crazy or this violent. Uh, but Isaiah 19 uh, talks about um, a highway, not a, necessarily a literal highway that goes from Assyria uh, through Israel to Egypt, in which people from that, the, those countries will join together uh, and they will worship and they will be a blessing uh, in the midst of the earth. And that should be our vision. Maybe it's a prophecy. And of course, being Anglicans, we're always a little nervous about prophecy. But that should be our vision, yeah, um, for the Middle East. You know, I don't have to hate the Palestinians. I don't have to demonize Israel. We can love both of them and care for both of them and uh, want the best for both of them and um, work beginning, starting with uniting believers that we begin to pray together, work together. And, um, you know, especially now amongst Muslims, there are more and more Muslims ever before who are open to the gospel. And um, we need to make sure as a church, whether it's in Iran or Algeria or Egypt, that we don't miss this opportunity. Yes, the, the, so it sounds like a cliche, 
uh, and I want to be very careful, but the solution is Jesus, or the solution is people, even if they at times may not be believers, yeah, putting into practice the teaching of Jesus, wanting to empathize with their enemies, wanting uh, reconciliation, being willing to forgive and not carry a grudge for generation after 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 generation. Yeah, I I I have hope. Not uh, not every day of the week, but usually on Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Saturdays. Um, that um, we we don't have to be imprisoned by some sort of fatalism. Okay. No, so there's truth to that. Jesus uh, called us to love our enemy. Paul took it a step further and said, we need to bless and love our enemy. And mm -hmm. um, yeah, th there is a way forward with Jesus, even though it sounds like a, a cliche, but... Uh, it, it, it really does work in this part, of the, uh, this part of the world. And by the way, I have to just clarify Loving your enemy does not mean tolerating evil no. or wickedness. Oh, no. Jeez. Uh, people think, you know, this is going to be peace, love, and work. Uh, yes, we love our enemy and we seek, but at the same time, you, we do not. Um, I'm reminded of Jesus, Peter and the conversation with, that he has with uh, uh, Jesus on the eve of his crucifixion. And I'm sure I'll get mail or people will disagree with me, but Peter says, I have two swords. And, and he asked Jesus, is that enough? And it's enough. It was enough for Peter to defend himself. It was not enough to take the sword and go out. He didn't have enough sword or swords or enough soldiers to go out and by the force of arms or using F-15s or X-16s, right, to, to bring in the kingdom of God, right? But when it comes to self-defense uh, or you know, abhorring evil, um, this is the... The, this is in part the job of the state. And uh, what happened 10 days ago was even, whoever, even if one has great sympathy for the Palestinians, it was a horrible, horrible uh, evil. It was demonic and uh, it needs to be denounced. And uh, there needs to be no compromise with this in any way, shape or form. All right. Looking a week, a year down the road, um, it looks, for all intents and purposes, that uh, the leadership in Israel wants to go into the Gaza Strip uh, and rid it of Hamas. Are we going? To, are we, we now going to reoccupy the Gaza Strip? No, I don't think Israel will reoccupy. It doesn't want to occupy the Gaza Strip. Uh, it wants. It doesn't want to keep. Uh, the people in Gaza in quote-unquote prison, and you hear this all the time. Gaza is one big open-air prison. Okay. Yes, Israel has a blockade on Gaza because it's run by a, uh, by gangsters, terrorists, yes, murderers, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. and their whole organization is dedica dedicated to the dismantling or the destruction and maybe even... Uh, genocide yes of, of the of the jewish state <clears throat> so obviously you have to protect yourself you know the the uh the qataris uh, gave gaza gave the people of gaza uh in the last few years one billion dollars and hamas stole half of that money to build tunnels and to buy arms but what could have been done with a with a billion dollars gaza could have been on its way to becoming singapore have been prosperous. People are not stupid there. Um, it has an, an incredible uh, geographical location. Um, it, it just could have been beautiful. But of course, Hamas is not only filled with hate, but uh, to use an expression that we all know is that basically they want to keep the population pregnant and barefoot. Uh, they want to uh, control the population and uh, uh, use them as they are now, for example, uh, as uh, as human shields, right? They're not encouraging education. They're not encouraging um, people to think for themselves. And if you show any kind of dissent, you can uh, be imprisoned or you can be you can be killed. Um, so it is an Islamic uh, it is an Islamic dictatorship. So <clears throat> Israel. Hopefully, I hope 
that Israel can get rid of Hamas and reestablish the authority of the Palestinian, reestablish the Palestinian authorities' uh, control over the Gaza Strip. Hopefully, they can do that. Eventually, can do that with Egypt uh, and the UN, and uh, that uh, this criminal uh, bunch of gangsters uh, and cutthroats will be, um, uh, you know, removed from power. But in the meantime, the, the big worry is not only about Gaza, but it's about the northern border. And if a land invasion begins, um, will Hezbollah, with Iran's um, permission, or it, actually Iran has to give the order, will they get involved? And um, Hezbollah, as we've mentioned before, they virtually have more missiles um, than any country in the world, with the exception of the United States. They have 120, 30,000 missiles. Many of these missiles uh, are in um, armories or um, uh, depots under mosques and churches uh, in, the, in South Lebanon, in the middle of villages. And of course, they're put there in public. Uh, on purpose, Israel, they will fire them at Israel. Israel will have to, to fire back. Many Lebanese civilians will be killed. And of course, the people will, uh, the, the Muslims around the world and also in Western cities, there will be uh, the most incredible condemnation of Israel, but not one word will be said about Hezbollah or Hamas, right? And the way that uh, they've uh, very cynically, cynically used these people. They, they won't be held to account, right? Okay, let's do worst case scenario. As we finish up, worst case scenario is this develops into World War Three. Worst case scenario, it develops into a regional war mm -hmm. in which the United States is pulled in. The United States starts to, to um, yeah, the United States gets involved in Lebanon or in other places against uh, Iran or even Iran itself. That's the worst case scenario. And uh, even if we get out of this, uh, it will in the end only strengthen Russia and China. Okay. So um, I'm very, I know Joe Biden may not be very popular among uh, some of your viewers, but and I think in some ways lately he's done the right thing uh, or someone behind him has done the someone right thing. Someone behind him has done the right thing. Someone yes. behind him has done, the, maybe it's Blinken or somebody, somebody okay. behind him has done the right thing. Uh, he's there, the U.S. trying to be cautious, trying to show support to, uh, for Israel. Um, and, and at the same time, we're also cautioning, uh, cautioning Israel, you know, you can't expect uh, a blank check from us. You know, you're, we're not, uh, we're going to be very, very careful. And so I think that one of the biggest prayer points is that this does not expand or widen uh, uh, any further than it is now. And, um, and I would hope there would, be, again, be a real serious fasting and prayer. So, What does your average uh, parishioner think about the war? Um, you know, Israel can be quite politically divided, but in this case, there is a huge, huge amount, amount of, of uh, across the board support in the Jewish population. Uh, Israel has a large Palestinian minority, and I'm talking about the West Bank, uh, but there's been uh, unequivocal uh, condemnation of uh, Hamas by Israeli Arabs. In fact, we even recently, a few days ago, had a Israeli uh, Arab church raise 20,000 shekels for us to help um, uh, with the Jewish refugees, meaning Jews who've had the Israelis who've had to flee their homes and uh, find someplace else to live out of the range of Hamas rockets. Um, so, yeah, uh, there's not a lot of confidence so much in uh the government itself, but um, the country is unified around the army, and for the most part, they're, I, 
it's, it's a little complicated, but they think that uh, there's good leadership at the top of the army uh, and that um, they will um, be successful. Uh, they called up reserves, 300,000 reserves, and every single person showed up. Yeah. In fact, people showed up who didn't even get call up notices yeah. saying, I want to serve. And so you have uh, the hundreds of thousands of soldiers. They're not just around Gaza, but they're on the northern border. They're on the Golan. Uh, they're all up and down the Egyptian border and the border with Jordan. We're expecting I have a parishioner who um, told me uh, he's an isolated spot on the Israel-Sinai border, and they're waiting for ISIS. Okay, because they expect uh, you know expect problems with uh, problems with ISIS, not just Hamas or Islamic Jihad. So. Um, yeah, the country is again is in this heightened heightened state, heightened state of alert. Um, All right. Well, people have been watching forty minutes of us talk about Israel. Uh, as we close out, give give us just some real specific things we need to be praying for. Well, again, um, I'd like to pray that we, being Christchurch and uh, other Christians, other believers, whether Arab believers or Jewish believers or or you know just folks like me doesn't quite fall into either camp um, that we can be salt and light at this time that uh, the, the Lord will give us an opportunity that as Paul prayed in Colossians that the door will be open for us to um, do those things that glorify God and uh, people will ask so that we can uh, give a uh, give a real uh, witness of a, a verbal witness Again, we have a, a lot of believers or Christians in harm's way, um, and uh, we just pray for their safety. Um, we want to, again, pray for especially people in Gaza that uh, the humanitarian aid will get through. And the two big ones that, uh, you know, Hamas can uh, be dismantled and destroyed. Um, without with uh, as little loss of life as possible uh and along with the that the fear of god will uh fall upon iran and hezbollah and that uh, they will dare not uh interfere and finally a fine prayer point which kind of sums all this up you know what the devil meant for for evil uh the devil's uh, wicked mischief will be turned to good uh, for the entire region, yeah, not just for Israel, but for Israel and uh, and the Arabs locally and around about. Okay, mm -hmm. people, that's people can be praying on those things for the next two or three months. Thank you so much for your time. Uh, it's been a blessing to talk to you, mm -hmm. uh, Kevin. I want to, I want to thank you for uh, allowing me to talk about this subject and and uh, not uh, turning it into a two-minute and eight-second soundbite. We can't. This is, this is the, the culmination of thousands of years of confusion, wickedness, and mm -hmm. uh, it, it's not going to end overnight, but we, we need to be on our knees and we need to be fasting and extremely intent on praying for uh, mm -hmm. you know, this situation. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, and yeah, we can't. By the we we just can't do this by ourselves, and we we just want folks to know if we're going to seriously, seriously pray and pray back God's word to God, sort of like Moses did on on the mountain uh, at Sinai. Uh, that you're on the front lines with us, and uh, we really appreciate you and and count on your, you know, count on your help. The financial help at this time is great, but if we don't have the Lord's presence. And uh, we're not empowered by the Holy Spirit. We might as well just all all of us take the next plane out of here. Yeah. Indeed. I'm Kevin Carlson. This has been David Poligli joining me for a special edition of Anglican Unscripted. <laughs>